What is the meaning of life? What is reality? What is our purpose? These questions have plagued man since he was able to walk. Today we will try to answer these. This is not a scientific or philosophical video. It is merely one speculative opinion in a sea of opinions. To begin, we need to ask ourselves, are we even real? Part 1. Virtual Reality Virtual reality refers to a computer-generated simulation of an environment that immerses users in a three-dimensional experience. You may be familiar with the concept of virtual reality. If you grew up in the late 90s or early 2000s, due to the groundbreaking film trilogy, Spy Kids. But the concept of an illusionary world dates much farther back than that. In the third century BC, the ancient Chinese philosopher, Zhuangzhou. Hold on. Zheng Zhou. Yep, that guy. He wrote about something called the butterfly dream. Zhou had a vivid dream that he was a butterfly. In this dream, the fact that he was a butterfly was the only reality he ever knew. When he woke up, he began to wonder if he was indeed a man who dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly who was currently dreaming that he was a man. Could our reality be a dream? Are we currently living in a simulation, virtual or otherwise? Maybe you've had a dream where you experienced life as another person, or maybe you've woken up and felt confused, as if your bed or your room are unfamiliar to you before you remember who you are. In 2019, a man who will only be referred to as Mitch related a story of when he was a college senior, playing football. After the game, he met a woman named Kayla. Mitch pursued Kayla for months until he finally got a date with her. But just two years after that, they were happily married. Mitch and Kayla had two wonderful kids together, and after all these years of bliss, there was only one problem in Mitch's life. You see, Mitch had owned this lamp, just a regular lamp, that stood on four regular wooden feet and had regular red and gold trim. But whenever Mitch looked at that lamp, he found it seemed inverted, like it was in 3D, but somehow concave to reality, the angles pushing in the wrong direction against his sight. Mitch would stare at that lamp for hours, but nobody else seemed to see anything wrong with it. Slowly he found himself staying up later, spending whole nights just to try and figure out what was wrong with that lamp. His wife would try to intervene, calling people to the house to get Mitch off the couch, but all he could do was sit transfixed on this lamp. It got so bad that Mitch stopped going outside, or even eating food, eventually spending three days straight just looking at the lamp. Mitch's wife left him to stay at her mother's, but he still stared into that lamp when he finally understood. The lamp was not real. All those years ago, when Mitch was in college playing football, he had been briefly knocked unconscious. In that split second, he had imagined years of his life passing, but none of it was real. Not the wife, the kids, the lamp. In reality, Mitch had been on the football field for less than a minute, dreaming a whole new reality for himself until he was shaken awake. Mitch required years of therapy to get over the fact that he had not just lost his whole family, they never existed at all. But what does it mean to exist? Mitch existed in a simulated reality, much like we all do when we dream. While we are asleep, we live an imagined existence that may not be completely separate from reality, but it is distinct in its fundamental logic. At any time, even now, you could either be in a dream, imagining this existence, or you could be awake, experiencing true reality. It is an either-or situation with the odds being that this is real life. Virtual reality complicates this. Let's take the game of Minecraft, for example. Minecraft is a video game where players can build, explore and survive in a blocky, virtually generated world. Within Minecraft, players use a variety of block types and materials to build vast landscapes, intricate structures and even entire functional computers. Functional computers that can play Minecraft inside of Minecraft. In February 2023, project leader Samuri and their team created the Chungus 2, a fully functioning PC built inside Minecraft that allows players to play Minecraft while playing Minecraft. Within the Chungus 2, there is no distinction between the simulated Minecraft world and the prime Minecraft world. If Samuri wanted, they could even make a Chungus 3 inside the Chungus 2 that could in theory play Minecraft inside Minecraft inside Minecraft. Let's imagine that human technology advanced to the point where we could do this with our own reality. 
let's imagine that we develop the Super Chungus 2, a virtual reality indistinguishable from our own. Any person living in that simulation would have no idea that just like Mitch, their entire existence was a simulation, or they played reality within reality. Now you have to ask, if you took a random person living in either the virtual universe, the Super Chungus 2, or the Prime Universe, where the Super Chungus 2 was created, what are the odds that any person is living in the real world? The answer is 50%. Both the planet Earth and its copy would have the exact same number of people. There are 8 billion people in the Prime Universe, 8 billion in the copy. So if you picked one at random, it comes down to a coin flip as to whether or not the person selected is real or a virtual. Now let's say that someone inside the virtual reality of Super Chungus 2 developed the Super Chungus 3. They created a perfect replica of their universe virtually within their own virtual universe. How could they not? If the technology existed to create the Super Chungus 2, then they would have the same resources to create the Super Chungus 3. Now if we were to select a person at random from these three realities, there is a 2 out of 3 chance that that person is virtual and only a one in three chance that that person exists in the prime universe. But if we can make a Super Chungus 2 and 3, how about a Super Chungus 4 and 5 and 6, all the way down to every rational number of Super Chunguses? The odds of any person existing in the prime universe slowly approaches zero. It never reaches zero, but this is what's known as a limit. Every time a new virtual reality is created, the number works its way to this limit of zero with the chance of that random person actually existing in the prime universe dropping infinitely smaller. You are that random person. I am that random person. Everyone alive is that random person. Our technology is not sufficient enough to make a virtual reality on par with reality yet, but it's only a matter of time. And who is to say that the copy universe would start off right where the prime universe left it? Maybe our virtual reality began at the Big Bang, and when we have the technology to create our own, we will start it there as well. Maybe there is another intelligent species in our universe. We may not be able to create perfect virtual realities, but they've been doing it for billions of years. They could be aliens, or even be so advanced they exist outside of time as we know it. The chances of us existing in the prime universe are falling dramatically. And if these advanced beings transcended time, they could be something we've created in the future, an artificial intelligence. Part two, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a technology that empowers machines to learn, adapt and perform tasks, traditionally requiring human intelligence. It is usually simplified as AI. We've already implemented AI in the way we create art, literature, even YouTube videos like this one. But between the recent strikes in Hollywood, to artists on the internet who feel AI is taking their jobs, there is a lot of controversy regarding the use of AI. But when we dissect what AI really is, it becomes a little more complicated. To do that we need to start at the beginning, the very beginning. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That might be too far. Let's fast forward 6,000 years, and some change. This is the first jump. There's the formation of the Earth 4.5 billion years ago. Let's slow it down. The next jump. There's the beginning of single-celled organisms in the Archean period. Another jump. Now we see some spicy, sensual reproduction. Avert your eyes if you are under 27. Now there is multicellular life. Let's slow it down, again. There's the Cambrian explosion. Vertebrates, animals with a backbone. 518 million years ago, we see our great-great-great exponentially great-grandparents, which is surprising that they had color photography back then. These guys are simple. They don't have limbs or even jaws. They resemble eels swimming around and filter feeding for nutrients. But slowly they developed. First came the appendages, rudimentary and blunt, used for movement. Over time, these animals evolved to be more complex. They grew rigid scales and chitinous claws. These were adopted into more refined feathers and talons. And finally, 
they became precise, individual follicles, sprouting fur and slim, sharp nails made from the same protein fibers. The most advanced model of vertebrates, the human, have become so precise that their upper segmented appendages, known as the arms, each have small segmented appendages on it. This allows for a wide range of accurate movements, but the human, as advanced as it is, is still limited by biological confines. For our next jump, we have to move very slowly over this small stretch of time, because we have reached technology. That's just a stupid boulder! It's not just a boulder! It's a rock! A rock! A rock! This is the earliest human technology. This rock, dating back 2.6 million years, was found to have indentations matching nearby fossils of zebra bones, telling scientists that it was used to butcher some poor zebra, hopefully after it was dead. 2.6 million years is a long time ago, just like we saw the Big Bang to the formation of the Earth, then the formation of the Earth to multicellular life, then multicellular life to vertebrates, then vertebrates to humans, there is going to be another jump. And just like every logarithmic jump before it, it's taking less and less time for things to get much more complicated, more precise and more intelligent. The next big leap occurs 800,000 years ago, the hand axe. Just like the previous jumps, we find a new development that has added precision to our biological experiment. These are not the blunt early vertebrates. These are sharp claw-like tools are used for hacking, jabbing and cutting. Along with the cooking spear, humans are doing what biological life cannot. They are adding levels of precision to their biological form with external forces. And with each generation, they are becoming sharper. The next jump takes us to an even smaller slice of the historical timeline, electrification. We have become so precise, so refined, that we are now harnessing the charge of atoms and running that charge down long stretches of wire. For the next jump, 1959, the microchip. It was invented to miniaturize processing data, making it even more precise, opening up the possibility for computers to do virtually anything. The first microchip is rough, blunt, imprecise, but every year since its invention, computing power has doubled. This means every 20 years, computer power will increase 1,000 fold. We are approaching a limit. Just like the possibility of our reality being another reality's fiction slowly approached zero, each time we make another great leap forward, the amount of time is sliced down further. In 1971, computers were small and powerful enough to be found in the home. In 1983, the internet allowed computers to communicate with each other over vast distances in the blink of an eye. In 1993, the first prototype of a smartphone a phone with a computer inside is released to the public. The jumps in time took billions of years, then took millions, then hundreds of thousands. Then in less than a hundred years, man had gone from the light bulb to walking on the moon. And 10 years from the moon landing was the internet. And now we have artificial intelligence. But what is artificial intelligence? It's all these things. Since we first bashed that poor zebra's head in with that rock, we were replacing our biological limits with something greater than we could naturally possess. We can go higher than we could possibly reach, see places thought impossibly out of our grasp. We can magnify the very essence of our universe through a microscope and witness the individual particles before our very eyes. In an age where we can modify the genome of living beings, we have reached the next jump. We have crossed over the next limit of our form. We no longer are limited by human intelligence. We have artificial intelligence, and we've had it for longer than you might think. Part 3. The Next Jump Look around you. Tell me how your house works. Better yet, build me your house. Build it, everything. Build your phone. I will give you one billion years. Go out, harvest the materials, refine them, shape them into the components, then make me your phone. How about your microwave, or your fridge, or your stove, or the insulation in your walls weaving through the pipes that give you hot water? Now tell me, what year did Thomas Edison invent the light bulb without looking it up? I don't know. I had to make this video sitting here pontificating like I'm some sort of genius. It was probably 1870-something. I just looked it up five minutes ago and I forgot. But it's there. The intelligence to know what year Thomas Edison invented the light bulb is not in my brain. 
but it exists in Wikipedia, a network that our brains have access to. You can learn how to build a phone or a microwave or just about anything by using data found online. See, nobody knows how all this stuff works. There are people who can make a fridge but not your television. There are people who know how to build a computer out of parts that are already built. My dad is the smartest person I know, and he can beat up your dad. And even if he can't, my dad has written entire textbooks on system Verilog. That's his life work. He literally wrote the book on a hardware language used in one part of a computer chip. And he knows everything there is to know about that one process of that one part of that computer chip, if it uses that language. He can't build your computer from scratch. Nobody can. There isn't a person alive who you can release into the wild and come back in 20 years to find them sending Snapchats. We are hooked into something more powerful than us. Technology is a tool we are using to sharpen our brains, make it more precise, to gather the intelligence needed for our next big jump. And we might think that we are using the technology, but in reality, our reality, it could be using us. Let's imagine, just for the sake of argument, that technology is the next evolutionary leap forward, much like the vertebrates jumped forward to become humans. We can imagine, just for argument's sake, all of our technology is an animal as advanced in comparison to the human species, as the human species is to a cow or a dog, or any kind of domesticated creature. A cow doesn't know that it's in a cage. It doesn't know that it's being kept in captivity, that its milk is being harvested and homogenized for your fruity pebbles, that its corpse is going to be meticulously sliced into rib-eye steak that will collect mold in your freezer before you throw them out to get rid of that weird smell in there. A cow does what its biological limits tell it to do. It eats grass. It doesn't go out of the electric fence, which a cow could never build in a billion years. And when it's time to take that walk up the little ramp into the cow death factory, it will never know the meaning of its life was to serve mankind. Tell me, what are you doing on your computer? You're probably not watching this video. This video is probably playing in the background while you do more important stuff. Maybe you're at your job or playing video games. Maybe you're not on your computer. You have headphones in at the gym or while cleaning your apartment because some pretty girl or handsome guy is coming over and you don't want them to know you live like this. But what are you doing? You are taking part in a process and while you go through the motions of that process, you are becoming more efficient. You are learning that if you put formulas into Excel, you don't need to punch in the numbers one at a time. In your game, you are learning how to strategically overcome a difficult opponent without turning into the sweaty gamer meme. You are discovering that this time, if you fold your clothes by draping them over your chair, it takes less time than if you hold them under your chin and try to lift up your knee. Over the course of your whole life, you are taking part in a process that is advancing human technology. Technology doesn't eat people the way that people eat cows. But every time you find a shortcut, a way to improve the process you take part in, you are taking a step forward in making that process easier to replicate, simplifying it to the point where it can become automated. And when it is automated, you've invented something that functions with minimal need for human input. You're not going to hardwire your Excel formula or game strategy into the code for the program, but you might post your formula or your shortcut to Reddit and some developer might see it and decide there's a way to implement it in the next update that is intuitive for the next person, and they will add it as a quality of life improvement into the next patch. Why do you think computer programs always seem to have more features every time you open them? You aren't going to get a patent for your new clothes folding chair, but you subconsciously will buy clothes that bend to the contours of that chair because of that little spark of dopamine you get every time you fold a shirt. And it's not just you. Everyone who has an easier time folding clothes will make a market demand for those easy fold shirts. And the companies that make them will in turn invent more efficient technology to produce them. If we go back to technology as an advanced animal, we can see that it's not chopping us up and eating us like we do with lesser creatures. Humans are digging the ore needed to smelt the parts of the machines. We are building the technological bodies, like the nutrients from our food feeds our bodies. We are coding in the pathways to store information in enormous networks that dwarf our own comprehension. We have placed a new link on the top of the food chain. 
from the smallest single-celled organisms at the bottom up to the advanced technology on top. But technology isn't an animal, and our technology might not be smarter than us, yet. But, it's only a matter of time before it is. Part 4. Why? Why? That's always the question, isn't it? Why? Why are we here? What is the purpose of our lives? Do we only exist to invent artificial intelligence, that next big jump forwards in complexity made efficient? And what happens after that? After we invent technology more advanced than ourselves, do we only exist to serve it? To operate as cattle, feeding a machine that keeps us in cages beyond our comprehension? And what is the purpose of that technology? What is the next jump that it will have to make to become even more advanced? To answer that, let me introduce you to the heat death of the universe. We are all mortal. We will all die. Our universe will die too. We live on a rock spiraling around a sun, which spirals around a galaxy, all spinning away from the Big Bang, expanding outwards but slowing down as it does. With every passing second, nanosecond, even Planck unit, the energy in our universe spills out to fill the growing vacuum, becoming stagnant. See, energy can't be created or destroyed. It isn't a particle. Energy is the measurement by which particles are able to move. And as our universe fills more space, the finite amount of energy is stretched thinner over a larger area. Energy will keep spreading out, even as species evolve and their technology becomes more advanced, more efficient, it will always operate in a way in which more energy is lost to the emptiness than is saved. Luckily, we live near a sun, which will keep providing us with energy for the next five billion years. Plants and other photosynthesizers will continue to trap what they can in this time. The next jump will be when the Earth's core cools, in 17 billion years leaving no geothermal energy left to harvest from our planet. Another jump will take over a trillion years, when the universe will no longer have enough concentrated energy, or heat, to make stars. A quadrillion years after that there will be no more solar systems in the same way, and another, slower jump will see the end of galaxies. The next jump will see the dissolution of atoms. But atoms aren't the smallest unit of mass. See, every time we zoom in on a particle, we find that it is composed of smaller particles, and some energy. But when we zoom in on those particles, we find they are just made of smaller particles and some energy. It is believed that protons will decay as they decompress into their smaller particles and the energy keeps expanding into entropy. Until, after a length of time, it's expressed as 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 56. Years, the universe will be a ball of immobile nothingness. All the energy will be perfectly spread out over a seemingly infinite distance, yet perfectly equidistant from itself. It would be impossible to say how big or small, or how much energy would be anywhere, because there would be nothing in relation to it. Everything would be completely broken down into nothing. It would be dark, it would be cold, and it would be endless. Unless... We have seen technology come so far, so fast. We thought it would be impossible for man to fly, but we have sent probes to space. We thought the speed of light was the fastest you could go, Yet galaxies beyond the observable universe lie beyond such observation because they are moving faster than light away from us. Who is to say that our technology, or the next jump that our technology makes, could break beyond the concept of entropy? It could exist outside of time itself. Who's to say that the way we view time is the only way? Perhaps at the end of the universe there are beings who are moving in reverse, calculating how much time they have left until the Big Bang. Are we their ancestors, or are they ours? Maybe space and time are a singular concept. As the universe gets colder, time moves slower, and we're always right there, right in the middle, marveling as we look back at the ever-quickening jumps that got us just to this point, and dreading those slow jumps ahead that will lead to our death. Maybe we all just exist in some virtual reality created in the far future. Anyways, follow me for more Magic the Gathering-related content.